Welcome to Morningstar Christian Chapel YouTube channel. Please remember to hit that subscribe button, like button, and the notification bell so you can find out when we go live or post a new video. And be sure to leave a comment about what God has shown you in this message. Thanks, and enjoy the study. Shall we open our Bibles this morning to the book of Job chapter 3? For the next three Sunday mornings, we're going to take a look at some of the lessons that we can learn from Job, beginning this morning with a message entitled, Why Was I Born Anyway? The book of Job is dated back to the days of Genesis. It is one of the earliest books of the Bible, though it is not obviously placed first in it. There's a lot of internal evidence in the book that would tell you that that was really the time of Job. For one thing, his length of life. Secondly, that his wealth was considered in livestock. Thirdly, that there was no official priesthood yet. Job was the high priest of his own family. We also read that his daughters were co-heirs with their brothers, which under the Mosaic law did not happen. The Chaldeans and the Sabians that are mentioned were nomadic tribes. Later on in the scriptures, they will be massive and, and far-reaching and not wandering or nomads. It's hard to tell where Job lived. Most guesses are in the Syrian wilderness, which is, I guess, reasonable based on what you read in the scriptures. And then I should say to you, this is an inspired account but it accounts for us things that are said that are not always true. In other words, some of the presented philosophies in the book of Job from his counselors and even from Job himself really need to be laid aside the rest of the scriptures and compared to see if these theories that are presented in the midst of trials are biblically correct. They are spoken, that's true. They are accurately uh, recorded <clears throat> but not, not always is the truth declared in their statements. What we do have from Job are some sure lessons that God would have us to learn, maybe the largest one of which is that we find a man who is stripped of everything he counted dear. He is reduced to his bare existence. He will lose his family. He will lose his wealth. He will lose his, he lose his health. He will lose his friends. He will lose his self-worth. He just wants to die. Cursing the very day he was born. In Job, we find a man who is reduced to caring only about the things that really matter. No more majoring on the minors. No more first world problems. No more politics, price of gasoline, terrible neighbors. Everything in Job's life has been stripped away. We will learn, and you can read through the book of Job, the ways of the devil and how his plans are to destroy you. The purposes of God and why he allows the things that he does. The need for all of us, even as good as Job, the may, maybe the most holy man on the planet at that time, to repent and turn to the Lord. The book will address why the righteous suffer, why the foolish have counsel that will take them away from God, and their ideas that turn against the things of the Lord, and the practical idea that you should live every day with a conscious awareness of God's presence with you. And we've done a long series of studies in the book of Job. You can find it in the bookstore and the archives, but we wanted to just pick two or three things that we thought were helpful for us on a Sunday morning and look at a couple of his questions as he went through his trials. In the process, basic questions. They're the kind that plague every man's heart. Um, they, are, they are questions that God will answer and, and that God will reveal himself to Job in a way that says God cares, God knows, and God has a plan. He, he, he's going to finish what he started. The background and setting for Job's cry here in chapter 3 <clears throat> are obviously found in the first two chapters 
we are, where we are given insights that Job is completely unaware of, spiritual insights that he doesn't know that we are told. We are told, for example, in chapter 1, verse 1, that Job was a good man, that he feared God and he shunned or he hated evil, and I think you need both. Job was a spiritual man. He prayed daily and often. The Lord said of Job in chapter 1, verse 8, that there was no one on the earth like him. Now, if the Lord says that about you, hopefully that's in a positive light. But it was certainly uh, his spiritual depth was phenomenal, especially in the days that he lived with the little revelation that he would have understood. We are given so much more by the time you get to the New Testament of the character and the ways of God. We are told that Job was an extremely wealthy man, that he had an abundance of sheep and oxen and even female donkeys for milk, which at least in that time would have been a delicacy. He had a huge household. He had seven sons and three daughters, besides lots of servants. But like I said, at least in the beginning of the book of Job, God calls you into a meeting between him and the devil up in heaven where you could really get some insight into what was going on in Job's life there upon the earth, behind the scenes and inside kind of a glimpse. <clears throat> it is almost the answers to what you sometimes say, what in the world's going on here? <laughs> well, let me show you, says the Lord. And he reveals early on to us in the book the heavenly things that were going on that neither Job or his family or his friends were privy to. We read of Satan's appearance early on before God, and God questions, Satan, where have you been? And have you considered Job? The word considered being a, a, a military word that means to study intently, to try to find a weakness so that you might attack this position. Have you, have you had your eye on Job? And Satan answered that he had, because that's what he does. And he said to the Lord in conclusion, I think he's faithful to you because he serves you as a mercenary. He doesn't serve you for, anything, for nothing. You give him whatever he wants. His life is good. The blessings are, are endless. His kids are fine. Couldn't be better. Of course he loves you. Yet if you curse his wealth, he will curse you to your face. And God gave permission to the devil <clears throat> to take away Job's wealth, but restricted him from touching Job himself. Again, Satan is only allowed to do what God allows and permits, and only within the parameters that God specifically sets. And if you belong to the Lord, you're, you're in good shape. So Satan went after Job the very next day, according to chapter 1. And in a moment's time, the horrible news of his great losses that he had began to suffer arrived on his doorstep. News that the Sabians had raided one of his farms. They'd stolen his donkeys and oxen. They'd killed the servants in the process. That, that farm was destroyed. While he was yet being told, another fellow showed up at the door and said, well, lightning has struck your sheep herds, and they and the servants that were watching them have all been killed. And while that was being told, a third guy came to the door, reported that the Chaldeans with three bands had raided his camel herds and took them all for themselves and killed all of his herdsmen. At least, at last, I should say, and certainly the worst, came news of his eldest son having a party at his house where all of his children were at when a tornado came and caved in the house, killed all 10 of his kids at once. We read at the end of chapter 1 <clears throat> that Job rose up in grief, tore his robe, shaved his head, fell on his face, and began to worship God, saying, you're in charge. Blessed God, 
He has given them to me. God can take them away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And, and then the Lord says to us, Job and all of these things did not sin. In chapter 2, as before, a picture of the discussion in heaven between the Lord and Satan about his activities, particularly as they uh, um, applied, if you will, or related to Job. And again, our Lord bragged about his faithful servant. Have you seen Job and how he has held on to his integrity, though he has suffered the loss of everything that was dear to him? Satan gives his second postulation about his theories of why that is so, and he said, well, a man will give anything for his life, and if you take away his health, he will turn on you and curse you to your face. And so God again gave permission to Satan that Job might be physically afflicted, but he said, save his life, spare his life, don't take his life. And again, this control that God has over your enemy and for the purposes of your life, allowing Satan to do certain things that from our side look pretty devastating, <clears throat> from God's side have a bigger picture. We are told that the affliction of Job contained the covering of his body with painful boils from head to toe, that he could barely sit down. He scraped these boils with pieces of broken pottery. And through all of this, Job did not cry out against God. He did not curse God. His wife at this point did. She said to him in chapter 2, why don't we just curse God and die? I mean, how can this be good? Instead, Job sat silently for seven days, surrounded by three supposed friends who saw his tremendous grief and would be a tremendous grief to him in the, in the days and weeks to come. When Job finally spoke out, he cursed the day that he was born. Look at verse 1, chapter 3. After this, Job opened his mouth and he cursed God, uh, sorry, cursed the day of his birth and, and said, May the day perish on which I was born and the night in which it was said a male child is conceived. And may that day be darkness. May God above not seek it nor the light shine upon it. Verse 11, just jumping ahead. Why did I not die at birth? And why did I not perish when I came from the womb? Why did the knees receive me, or why did the breasts that I should nurse? Usually in our life, these kind of questions are crowded out by the daily material and fleshly concerns. We are preoccupied with so many things that we very rarely get to the bottom of things. Our lives are filled with almost meaningless things. Yet when we are brought to the bottom as Job is here, we do find people asking deeper questions and looking for answers with a greater sense of urgency. If you've ever sat in on a funeral preparation with a family that has lost a father or a son, a wife, daughter, you, you find that the questions are much more important that the things that maybe preoccupy your daily life no longer preoccupy theirs. They want to talk about life's purpose, about the value of relationship, about the brevity of life, about the remembrance of things that matter. They want to talk about the will of God and is there life after death. Vital things that, that are usually uh, to the, pushed to the back. I guess we don't want to talk about them because daily life so preoccupies us. Unfortunately, that awareness usually only lasts for a little while. And then you're back to nonsense. 
you've ever had a chance to go to the mission field in a third world country where people actually suffer for their ministry, you will come home asking yourself why you spend so much money on the things that you do, vowing to do better, to be more cognizant of, of your stewardship. But that only lasts a little while. Job here had lost all he had valued and counted dear and is reduced to considering only the most important and vital things in his life. And they give rise to lots of questions. There are a lot of them found in the book before he finally comes to where he needs to be. But the question in verse 3 from a grieving Job amounts to, what am I doing here? Why was I born if this is the way life goes? If you believe what man believes, apart from God, then you came into being as a part of the evolutionary process over billions of years that are really the result of accidental occurrences. And if that is your position, then you have to conclude that you were born by accident and you have no real purpose in this life at all. What you can do is you can clutch to what you want with great fear, knowing that eventually you're going to lose it. Everyone dies, gets sick, suffers, dies. And one bad break, sometimes younger than you want, and everything in life that you can dear will be gone. If life has no creator with an intelligent design and purpose and love, who brought you into existence by his will, then you will struggle to find real purpose for your life at all. You will live like a hog and die like a dog, as the old saying goes. And it really describes then the life of every man. You are alone. You are the product of chance, and your future is like playing the lottery. You might get a little money back once in a while, but in the long run, you're a loser. You might recall all the money that has been spent by our government over the years on listening stations in outer space in the hopes of finding other people as miserable as we are. with whom we can share our accidental existence. Carl Sagan, a year, years ago, wrote a book that was made into the movie Contact, which addressed both the hunt for life in outer space and the blasphemous attitude of man uh, towards the concept that there can be a God at all. Evolution leaves you by yourself, without a purpose, in a dog-eat-dog -dog world where the survival is of the fittest, as man is just the last rung on an evolutionary animal ladder, and man is not a happy animal. Continuing to prove that daily in the news reports of carnage and abuse and lying and misuse and selfish ambitions and mass murders and corporate raiders and the neglect for the poor. Welcome to the evolutionary process. Now make the best of it and get yours because someone's coming to take it away. However, if you believe all of the universe was created by a good and almighty God, and Job will come to that understanding, then you also know your life was no accident it was a thoughtful action on behalf of a loving God who longs to share his life with you for all of eternity. And he made you for that purpose. You were made to be with him. He knew the price he would have to pay to redeem you from your sin, but he made you anyway, because to him that was the value of your life. And how greatly we are affected by the way we live when we think about the, the beliefs that guide our life, especially our origins and our purposes for life. There are those, and there's many of them, that live just for the now. 
Their theme is found in the words, eat and drink, be merry, tomorrow you'll die. A quote that is usually ascribed to Epicurus. I think really it came out of 1 Corinthians, though. They leave, live with a me-first philosophy, and they brag that they did it my way. Since I have come from nowhere and I'm going nowhere, I should at least live to please myself today. I shouldn't be concerned about you or even the consequences of judgment because they don't exist. But if you believe in the God who made you, then you live your life with an eye squarely upon the eternal. And you have a different philosophy of, of life. Your, your philosophy is for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. We leave to please the Lord and, the, and to seek things that will please him, grateful for our salvation, looking forward to seeing him face to face. The philosophy of the world has always been get for yourself by any means possible. Take care of number one. Yet the philosophy of a Christian is give yourself away. It's better to give than to receive. The worldly man will hate those who hate him. The Christ-centered man will bless those who curse him. So Job's cry and all of his distress was, why am I here? It's a huge question that everyone needs to answer. Why are you here? Because your life isn't very long. And then what? According to God's word, the purpose of my being born at all is that I might come to know God and bring pleasure to him in serving him in love. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist, and then they were created, Revelation 4. The world due to sin suffers much, but there is a deliverance from all of the consequences of sin, and God has provided it. The Bible makes it very clear that God wants to be known. If he didn't want you to know him, you'd never find him. But everything he designed was so that you might. In all of his distress, Job is at the bottom. Why am I here? This is as bad as it could get. Oh, no, it gets much worse. The Lord desires that you would come to know him and to, and to be known by him. It is that very truth that, that John, at 90-some years old, was just overwhelmed by. When he wrote his, his first little epistle there towards the back of your Bible, he says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard and we saw with our own eyes, we've looked upon, we've handled concerning the word of life, this life that was made known to us, we've seen it, we bear witness to you, this eternal life, which was with the Father, made manifest to it. We've seen it, we've heard him, we've had fellowship with him. It's with Jesus, and we want him to have that fellowship with you. God has provided a way forward. And John marvels that the word of life had been made known to him, set on display. When the psalmist wrote Psalm 19, he said, The, the heavens declare the glory of God. The earth shows forth his handiwork. Day unto day they utter their speech, and night unto night they reveal their knowledge. There's no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Everywhere you look, creator, <laughs> intelligent design. Unless you turn back to evolution and there's no place for you to look. Prophets of old, filled with the Spirit, declared things they didn't understand, yet proclaimed them faithfully. In the last days, Paul said to the Hebrews, God has spoken to us through his Son. I can come to know God, and the Bible declares that trusting Jesus is the way that I come to know him. 
He's my way in by faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please him for he who comes to God must believe that he is and he rewards those who diligently seek him. When they said to Jesus in John chapter six, what shall we do to do the works of God? Jesus looked them square in the eye and said, this is the work of God. You believe in him whom he sent. I do not please God by my works or efforts until, unless they are generated from a life that has been redeemed. The Bible tells us that the life on this earth is not the end of life. In fact, it's a small part of it, but it's a, a vital part because it is in this window, however long your days will be, in which you are given the, the call to make a choice about God and his ways. Whether you will follow him or not, desire to dwell with him or not, seek his glory or not. Jesus said to Martha, when she ran out of her house after Lazarus has died to confront him about the fact he hadn't showed up in time. If your brother, if you just had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And Jesus said, he'll live again. But that wasn't enough for her. And Jesus turned Martha around there in John chapter 11, verse 25, and he looked her in the eye and it says he loved her. And he said, Martha, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he dies, he's going to live. And if he lives believing in me, he'll never die. The Bible tells us there's life after death, but it also tells us there's death after death. That one day, death and hell will give up their dead and they'll stand before the Lord and be judged. But if you take part in the first resurrection, the second death will have no power upon, over you. So this life is fairly short, but it is vital because this is the only time you get an opportunity to decide your future based on what you know about God and his ways. Each day of life here teaches you to look for eternity. And certainly the struggles and the difficulties that we face like Job will focus your attention not upon the temporal, but upon the eternal. Job had nothing left. Nothing to consider, but what now? It will be 14 chapters from now that, that Job will say, I know if I could, if I knew that I would live again, my children would live again, I could bear the grief. And it won't be much later that he said, I know one day I'm going to stand before my Redeemer that he lives. And by the time you get to the end of the book, it's Job throwing his hand over his mouth and saying, I didn't know anything now, but now I see you. Just heard about you, but now I know you. In all of these trials and all of these difficulties, God prepares us for what lie ahead. You shall show me the paths of life. We read it this morning. In your, in your presence, there's fullness of joy. Why were we born? Why are you born? Why are you here? Ultimately, ultimately, that you would come to know God through his son. Everything else doesn't matter. And to be honest with you, the minute you die, it won't matter. You're here to live in faith, to please the Lord, to have him be the reason for your life. You're not here by accident, and you're not alone, and God does love you, and he has made provision for you, and all in life is ultimately designed to bring you to the place Job will end up, surrendering to God. Oh, my life has been so difficult. I'm sure that it has. Nobody gets through unscathed. But if it brings you to your knees and gets your eyes upon heaven and gives you to value the things that are really valuable, then God continues to draw you close to him. The greatest question in this life can this, have you received Jesus? Is he the one that you're holding on to? Because ultimately, one day, standing before the Father, the question's going to be, what have you done with my son? And if you've poo-pooed his blood that was shed and trampled underfoot his sacrifice, 
There will be no hell too hot that God won't send you to because it's his son that he wants to honor. But hey, the invitation is there. Come, find life. Why was I born? Job, God has great plans for you. I'm suffering so much. You certainly are. But at least you're in a position where nothing distracts you from the purpose for which God made you. And I should just tell you, if you haven't read ahead, Job ends up with twice as much as he lost. But now it doesn't matter to Job because now he's all enthralled with the God that he serves. Have you received Jesus? That's the question. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you this morning for your word to us. What a, what a powerful chapter this, this book of Job sets before us. To just be taken down to that place of having nothing left. And we so rarely, we see it, we can read about it, we hope it never happens to us, and yet we realize that, that, the, that the target for Job as well as for us is to come to a place where the only thing that matters is you and your word and your love and our devotion to you, your, our faith in your son. The realization that you have brought us to yourself, that you have, have made us and then we're willing to pay a, a horrible price so that we could live. And now you just want us to not be so attached to this world that we get caught up in the day-to-days of things that really don't matter and we, we set aside the one thing that does, our relationship with you. <clears throat> Bring us, Lord, back to that place of just realizing and counting our blessings and, and, and understanding, God, that our name is written in the book of life. Our sins have been washed away. You remember them no more. And you are waiting one day to stand and greet us into your kingdom and into your presence. May we take the good news that the world doesn't have because they are so buried under so many trivial things they never get to the real questions until often like Job they are brought to the end of themselves. And this to a man who loved God, who was the most spiritual man on the planet. You know how much we need to learn this lesson as well. May you be first, Lord. <clears throat> and if this morning you don't know where you stand with God, our pastors will be up front. We'd love to talk to you about your relationship with Jesus. Because it's the only name given among men whereby we must be saved. If you're watching online, if you'll follow the, the link in the description box, you'll, there's a page there that'll take you to that We'll address the same things that we're going to talk about here. Just be ready to stand before God. Why was I born? Because God loves you. Why am I here? Because he wants to share his love with you. In the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Paul would write that the, the trials of this present time are, are small, <laughs> insignificant compared to the glory that's coming. Will God allow suffering in our lives? Sure, because there's a greater good here. He wants your attention, your love, your commitment, your trust, because at the end of that relationship is eternity. And Satan would want to destroy, but God uses things for your good. All things work together for good to those who love the Lord. So don't get caught up on the trivial stuff. The important things happen <laughs> at the foot of the cross. Shall we stand?